How do you detect that type of gases that are on the planet from a distance? And that's, going back to that, that's what people were skeptical about. When I first started working on exoplanets, long time ago, people didn't believe we would ever, ever, ever study an exoplanet atmosphere of any kind. And now dozens of them are studied. There's a whole field of people, hundreds of people working on exoplanet atmospheres, actually. Wow. And, so at first there was yes. a point where people didn't even know there was exoplanets, right? When was the first exoplanet detected? The first exoplanet around a sun-like star, anyway, was detected in the mid-1990s. That was a big deal. I kind of vaguely remember that. Well, at the time it was a big deal, but it was also incredibly controversial. Because in exo, you know, in planets, we only had one example of a planetary system, our own solar system. And in our solar system, Jupiter, our big massive planet, is really far from our star. And this first exoplanet around a sun-like star was incredibly close to its star, its star. So close that people just couldn't believe it was a planet, actually. So maybe zoom out, what the heck is an exoplanet? An exoplanet is our name, <laughs> like is the name that we call a planet orbiting a star other than our sun. Right, extrasolar, I guess is the name. You can call it extrasolar. Mm -hmm. okay. Exoplanet is simpler. But I think it's worth pausing to remember that each one of those stars out there in our night sky is a sun. Right. And you know, our sun has planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc. And so for a long time, people have wondered, do those other stars or other suns have planets? And they do. And it appears that nearly every star has a planet, has a planet we call exoplanet. And there are thousands of known exoplanets already. So there's already, yeah, like there's so many things about space that it's hard to put in, into one's brain because it starts filling it with awe. So, so yeah, if you visualize the fact that the stars that we see in the sky aren't just stars, they're like, they're suns. And they very likely, as you're saying, would have planets around them. There's all these planets roaming about in this like dimly lit darkness with potentially uh, life. I mean, it's just mind blowing. But um, may maybe can you give a brief like history of and like of discovering all the exoplanets? So there's no exoplanets in the 90s. <laughs> and then there's a lot of exoplanets now. So how so did that many, come about? So many planets. How did it come about? Well, and what, maybe another way to ask is what is the methodology that was used to discover them? I can say that. But I'd like to just say something else first, where, so in exoplanets, you know, the line between what is considered completely crazy and what is considered mainstream research, yeah. legit, it's constantly shifting. This is awesome, yeah. So before, when I started on exoplanets, it was still sketchy. Like it wasn't considered a career, a thing, a place where you should be investing. Yeah. And right now, now today, it's so many people are working in this field, a good, I don't know, at least a thousand, probably more. I don't know if that sounds like a lot to you, but it's a lot. No, yeah, but, so it's a legitimate field of inquiry. Yeah, legitimate field of inquiry. And what's helped us is everything that's helped everyone else. It's software, it's computers, it's hardware. It's like our phones. You have a fantastic detector in there. Like they didn't always have that. I don't know if you remember the so-called olden days. We didn't have digital cameras. We had film. You take a film camera, you send the film away, and eventually it comes back, and then you see your pictures. <laughs> and they could all be horrible. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, digital, so. it just changed everything. Data changed everything. Yeah. Uh, and so, so one thing that really helped exoplanets were detectors that were very sensitive. Because when we're looking for this, the, the transiting planets, what we're doing is we're monitoring a star's brightness as a function of time. Mm -hmm. It's like click, taking a picture of the stars every few seconds or minutes. And we're measuring the brightness of a star, like every frame. And we're looking for a drop in brightness that's characteristic of a planet going in front of the star and then finishing its so-called transit. And to me make that measurement, we have to have precise detectors. And uh, the, the, the detectors that are making the measurement, can you do it from Earth? Is it, uh, are they floating about in space? Like Both, what kind of telescope? Mm -hmm. Both. So on the ground, people are using telescopes, small telescopes that are almost just like a glorified telephoto lens. And they're looking at big swaths of the sky. And from the ground, people can find giant planets like the size of Jupiter. So it's about 10 to 12 times the size of Earth. We can find big planets because we can reach about 
one percent precision. So I'm not sure how technical you want to get, but well, yeah. Well, how many pixels are we talking about? Like what? Uh, <laughs> you mentioned phones. There's a bunch of uh, megapixels, I think. So for exoplanets, you want to think about it as like a pixel or less than a pixel. We're not getting any information. But to be more technical, our telescope, you know, spreads the light out over many pixels, but we're not getting information. We're not tiling the planet with pixels. It's just like a point of light, or in most cases, we don't even see the planet itself, just the planet's effect on the star. But another thing that really helped was computers, because transiting planets are actually quite rare. I mean, they don't all go in front of their star. Right. And so to find transiting planets, we look at a big part of the sky at once, or we look at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or even in some cases, millions of stars at one time. And so, you know, you're not going to do this by hand, going through a million stars, counting up the brightness. <laughs> we So we have computer software and computer code that does the job for us and looks for a, you know, counts the brightness and looks for a signal that could be due to a transiting planet. And, you know, I just finished a job called uh, Deputy Science Director for the MIT-led NASA mission test. And it was my purview to make sure that we got the planet candidates, the transiting light curves, out to the community so people could follow them up and figure out if they're actual planets or false positives. So, so publish the data so that people could just... Uh, yeah, publish the data. All the, all the data scientists out there could crunch and see if they can discover exactly. something. They can discover something. And in fact, the NASA policy for this mission is that all the data becomes public as soon as possible. So anyone could act. It's not as easy as it sounds, though, to download the data and look for planets. But there is a group called planethunters.org, and they take the data, mm -hmm. and they actually crowdsource it out to people to look for planets. Yeah, and they often find find signals that our computers and our team missed. 